Hi, my name is Tristan Hall, and I'm the designer of such games as Gloom of Killforth and Shadows of Killforth and 1066 Tears to many others. And basically, at All or Nothing Productions, all of our games have a solo mode. So I'm here today to talk to you about some things to think about if you're designing a solo game. So basically, just some tips for you to mull over as you come up with your own masterpiece. Um, so for the start, I would always suggest the biggest and most important element of any game that you design, whether it's solo or multiplayer, is playtesting, of course. So you want to playtest your game over and over to death. And the great thing about solo games is that you can enjoy the process of playtesting because that's what it's designed for. So for me as a solo player, I don't really want to play two sides that are warring against each other and trying to play one to the best of my ability. I want to just get involved and immersed in the game straight away. So with designing a solo game, that gives you the opportunity to create that uh, experience for other players and experience it for yourself first and you know recognize the pitfalls and advantages of the system as you design it. So play test it to absolute death. And once you are comfortable with it, you can introduce it to your friends and family and have them play test it as well. And, Find out all the things that are broken or you know didn't work quite as you expected, um, and give you important feedback on how to improve it. But the final and most important step of playtesting is to get out to strangers, and there are lots of ways to do that. You can do it through playtesting play forums on places like Board Game Geek or in Facebook groups. Um, in the UK, there's Playtest UK who are a brilliant bunch of people who uh, will play test your game and give you straight up honest feedback. And what you need at that point is to be able to give them a copy of the rules so that rather than you guiding them like you would your friends and family, these are people who are gonna learn your game just from the rule book and point out all the things that are missing from that that you perhaps overlooked. And they're gonna play it with just the rules without your direct feedback. And that's great because that then shines a light on anything that might be missing or any uh, misunderstandings that might arise from your not being there to guide someone as they're, as they're playing it. So, play test to death. Super, super important. Um, then, with a solo game particularly, you've got to think about how to um, design it. What What's the sort of fundamental solo mechanism? So, an easy way to implement a solo uh, variant of an existing game is to introduce a sort of beat your score type element which would be, um, you know, score 20 points, and that makes you, an average player score 25 points, and that's good, score 13, that's great. Um, which is, you know, it works for a lot of Euro games, but some solo players can kind of find that uh, unsatisfying because it's, it, it doesn't give you that sort of level of engagement that playing against another player would. So the next sort of level up from that for a solo game specifically is to try and create the feeling um, that the player is playing against another living opponent and there are loads of ways to implement that and some are more complex than others and you might want to try and find a balance somewhere between beat your score and having a kind of uh, AI rule set or an automa as some call it the Stonemaier games often come with automa rules which allow you to play against um, play the game solo sometimes against multiple opponents and they can be quite complex you know you could get an eight page rule book describing just the, the solo rules and that makes for a more satisfying experience but also creates obviously a little barrier to entry because people have to learn how to play the game and then they have to learn how to play the solo um, AI automa version. So there's a lot to think about there in terms of like how complex you want it to be and how accessible you want it to be but the um, Stonemaier game certainly set a standard for like the level of complexity and detail that you can get in a solo game that makes people feel like they're playing against a person. For example, uh, rather than having, um, say, a, a card game where two players are playing against each other, playing cards down each turn, rather than having to emulate the entire experience of another player and which cards they're going to choose to pick and play and everything, the solo AI rules in your game could, for example, just do something specific that emulates the experience of playing it against somebody else. So just make the move for them, even if it kind of breaks the rules of your game, um, but it makes it feel like you're playing against a challenging opponent. And the way that, for example, Scythe does this, another Stonemaier game, 
is that the AI can cheat, but it also, so it can move further across the map than you'll be able to, it can create more enemies than you'll be able to, but it also takes away the, um, the upkeep, the, the manual labor that you have to go through to emulate another player, because it, you simply flip a card and it tells you what to do, rather than you having to think, what would another player do? So that's a really good way of sort of implementing instantly, this is what the solo bot does, and now it's your go, uh, without you as a player having to think what would be the best thing that they could do. So it just speeds up the play process, and it makes the player feel like their turns are going to be more like the play, and that their AI or solo bot turn is just going to be a quick read of a card, you know, and move on to the next stage. So again, it gives it just gives a more satisfying experience because it makes you feel like you're playing against someone who's challenging rather than just. I got 30 points last time, I hope I get 31 this time, kind of thing. Uh, so another important factor, um, the third one I would say would be variability, and how to keep your game interesting. So is there enough variability in the rule set? Is there repetitive mechanics in the game? And if there are repetitive mechanics, how do you, for solo players, make it more interesting? What makes them come back to it? How do those mechanics progress and change as as the game goes on and what keeps players addicted and wanting to make that next move and maybe get like the sort of dopamine rush that they get from achieving something as they're playing the game. So you've got to think really creatively about if, if you've got some very simple mechanics, how can the game um, change and uh, mutate them over the course of the game to make them more interesting and to keep players engaged and gripped right till the end without them thinking, for example, oh, I've definitely won this one or oh, I've definitely lost this one, I'm going to write it off. You know what's what's the hook that's going to keep them engaged and, and coming back to to play not just to finish the game but to keep breaking that game out and play it again and again uh, then number four i would say would be probably think about the difficulty and the sweet spot of difficulty so um and again this will come out with play testing or the, the maths that underpin the design of your game but trying to find a level at which the player every time they play feels like it's going to come right down to the wire so whatever um, method or type of game that might be that makes you think that okay you know if I had one more turn I could have won or if I had one more turn I would have lost but either of those two actions has got to be the absolute sweet spot for designing pretty much any game but especially for a solo game where you want people's attention um, to come back and over and over so um, the easiest way to do that would be to implement it difficulty levels and have an easy mode for players who are learning the game and just trying to get into it and then a normal mode which is the actual full game rules which maybe don't go as easy on you and a hard mode so once a player's played it and they've maybe completed it a few times they can level up that difficulty a notch and it gives them another reason to come back and play it like just like in a video game if you play it on normal or nightmare difficulty or you know super challenge difficulty and give you a reason to play through the whole thing again more often than explore different paths and so um, difficulty modes are a great way to introduce that and also bear in mind that once your game is produced and out there and people are playing it there's almost certainly going to be someone out there some extremely clever player who perhaps will know the game better than you at some point so create an even more difficult ch like challenge level perhaps even more than you could conceive of for those guys to come in and really you know test their metal against um, I speak from personal experience when I say some people know my games better than I do and have, you know, absolutely slaughtered the AI rules, for example, that we introduced with on War Games 1565 and, and 1066. Um, and so with the second print run, we released, we have three difficulty levels in the base game and with the second print run, we increased that to six difficulty levels. So it just keeps getting harder and harder and harder. And some of those I would struggle to beat, uh, but some of our best players find them like a real good, solid challenge. Uh, and so my final point, if I would keep this to a top five, would be, and it's probably a heathen thing to mention for solo play, but can you scale up your game to multiplayer? Is there a way to implement it that will allow other people to, to join in and play the game as well? And it might seem obvious, but that's just going to hugely increase your potential market if you are looking to kickstart it or sell it online or go to a traditional publisher. Certainly traditional publishers will look for um, four to five players generally, so solo play games are kind of still pretty niche, even though they're hugely growing in, in popularity. Um, but have a think about that and how you might be able to scale it up. Um, for example, uh, the latest game that we kickstarted that I designed called Bale Wraith is 
and was designed as a solo player game um, but it quickly struck me early on how easy it would be to implement multiplayer rules if each player had a copy of the game and they just bring their own copies together and then they can all play together as a multiplayer game so just something to think about so those are my um, top five tips to consider for designing a solo tabletop game i hope it's been of some use to you and i hope you forgive my quarantine homemade haircut um which is not at all inspired by the last kingdom um and i hope you enjoy the design and process that's the most thing uh, most important thing is have fun with your design and have fun playing and happy gaming